from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Here in the Middle West, we are proud of the advances made by modern medicine. This hospital in central Illinois is an example of the kind of institution on which our pride is based. It is a specialized hospital. Its patients are all suffering from mental illness. But mental illness has many forms and its care and treatment require the services of many types of technical experts. Naturally, licensed doctors and registered nurses are in charge of the patients in these buildings, but to their strictly medical skills has been added a whole area of therapy that seems far removed from the sick bed, the laboratory, or the operating room. It is this area that we are about to explore. Through the help of a play, we will discover how occupational, recreational, and industrial therapy can help in the process of curing the mentally ill. The actors and stagehands are all amateurs, at theatricals, that is, but not at therapy. In a sense, they're olders, or they will be playing themselves and their own patients. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am a doctor, a psychiatrist. But this evening, I'm happy to take part in a presentation that will introduce to you an important aspect of the curative techniques that we use in this hospital, and which are skillfully carried out by people who are not doctors. I'm talking about the occupational, recreational, and industrial therapy staffs who wrote the play you will see this evening, and who will act in it. These staff-friendly discussions. Let's see what happens at such a staff meeting. Hi, Miss Jordan. Hello, Ray. Well, Betty was initiated today. She had her first game group and did a first-rate job, too. Don't paint the picture too rosy, Ray. I wasn't too good, you know. Can't you just forget your work for a little while and liven up a little? Let's have some fun. Can't the meeting begin? It's really very late. I'm really very busy. We have a lot of ground to cover today, so let's begin. At our last staff meeting, we came to the conclusion that the only way we could grow in our work is to experiment constantly and to analyze and define our materials and methods. Miss Hewitt, you made a suggestion that might start us off today. You thought we might discover the different ways in which activities might be used to interest a patient who is difficult to arouse. Well. I guess I can best illustrate by telling you about John Latham, a young depressed patient who just wasn't interested in any activity. We tried sports, gym, crafts. We tried just about everything. Then once, during workshop period, when John was present, John, would you like to see what Alan Henry are making? Sure, we're making these for the kids at Lincoln. See mine's gonna be yellow, the red trimmings? Look at Henry there, he's making a duck. John, there are some other patterns in my desk. Here, you look through them. You might find something here you'd like to make. Got lots of tools around here. Use tools for all kinds of things. 
make all kinds of things. You can hammer them, you can chisel them, you can hammer them, chisel them. Kids are Lincoln is gonna like my rabbit. They're gonna play with it. You can hammer them, chisel them, hammer them, chisel them, hammer them, chisel them, hammer them, chisel them. Henry, Henry, hammer. that base seems to be getting a little loose. Do you think another screw might tighten it? Well, he won't do nothing. He ought to make some things, too. They're for the kids. Oh, he will. He's just looking for something he might like to make. What? In the dictionary? We've all had so much fun in our last spelling bee. How about having another next week? Would you like to do that? Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. John, would you look up some words for us in the dictionary? Hmm? Well, if we have a spelling match, we'll need words to spell. Would you look up some for us in the dictionary? How many? Oh, about 50. And not too hard to begin with. The discovery of John's interest in words was accidental. But Miss Hewitt was quick to take advantage of the accident. She used the words to provide an activity that would interest John. First, he helped with the spelling bees. Then he became well enough to conduct them himself. It was a few months later when Dr. Andrews visited John's group. Let's see what happened again in terms of a dramatization that will help us to understand the meaning behind these special therapies. Dr. Andrews was on general rounds that morning. I'm sorry, Henry, that's your last chance. You're part of the audience now, Hank. Next, spell pneumonia. John, can I interrupt you just for a moment? How about asking Dr. Andrews to join us in the spelling bit? Oh, hello, John, is this your show? Yes, it is, Doctor. Well, that's fine. Where do you like to have me stand? Well, right there is OK. All right. I think I've got a good word for you. Try ptarmigan. Ptarmigan? T-A-R-M-I-G-A-N. No. It's a certain species of northern grouse. Ptarmigan. Well, that should be a big help. <laughs> <laughs> T-A-R-M-I-G-E-N. No. I'm sorry. You had it right the first time. Except it begins with a P. You sure fooled me on that one. Well, it was a difficult word, but I like it. John's getting on very well. Perhaps a clerical job might be found for him, or work on the hospital newspaper. Step by step, as John is ready, other members of the staff, like Miss Hewitt, will guide him to recovery. Watching his progress and reactions, alert workers will help John to help himself. But from time to time, the therapists run across patients who don't seem interested in anything, who just cannot express themselves at all in words or actions. Jeanette, for instance, seemed afraid of everything. Well, hi there, Jeanette. You gonna start coming to our class? Hope you like it. We hope so too, Liz. We all like it here at the art class. Now here are materials for drawing. Or modeling in clay. You may choose what you wish, Jeanette. Would you like to sit here? Liz and Marge are working in clay too. 
Here is some soft clay you may use. I want to go home. I don't want to do anything. I don't belong here. I want to go home. See, this head on mine is too small. I'd like to make it larger. Could I have some of your clay to make it larger? Why don't you work up some for yourself, Liz? You know how. Then you could add some fresh and begin on the head again. Okay? Gee, I like to work in clay. You can hear it squish and squish. Hey, that's for you and that's for you. Look out, Liz. How can I make the walls on mine stronger? They seem so thin. Perhaps if we add some moist clay to the inside, it would strengthen it. Like that. See, now I've made my head larger. I think I'll take it off right here and give myself a brand new head. Sir, a brand new head. I like the one you have now, Liz. Do? That's very pleasing, Jeanette. May we show it to the others? Well, that's real nice, Jeanette. I like that. It's the first thing I ever made. To make something. To be proud of it. To be praised for it. Those are reasonable goals for all of us. But Jeanette would have been quick to sense it. Either had the praise been too strong, or had Anne's support been lacking. Jeanette thought the ball was beautiful, and that's enough for us. We're not looking for perfection. As a matter of fact, perfection can be a problem in itself. Sometimes patients will concentrate so thoroughly on one task that it blots out everything else in their lives. The routine of a skill already well learned can be used as a wall behind which to hide. Mr. Biederheim? Mr. Biederheim, it will rest you if you join us for a few minutes. Then you can go back to your work. Come, end it there, then you can easily begin again. Please come.
Jordan. Mr. Biederheim just weaves. He doesn't talk to anyone. He doesn't even choose his own colors or his designs. He's just a piece of machinery. I guess he's been at it so long he can't do anything else. Of course he can't. Why disturb him now? He's not the least bit of trouble as he is. Why spoil my perfectly good work group? Mrs. Puster, we're trying to help Mr. Biederheim develop an interest in other things, and eventually in people. Aren't you willing to help us? Of course, but it's a waste of time. Let's try anyway. After all, making rugs for the hospital isn't the chief function of your workshop anymore, is it? Now, how are we going about helping Mr. Biederhahn? What's your idea? Could we have another patient work on the loom alongside of him? Well, he'd never permit that. It would spoil his perfect work. Well, how about a worker then? Mrs. Smith here, learning to weave from him. Would require a great deal of patience and tact, but... That might be a solution. We could try it, and if it doesn't work out, we can think of something else. Mrs. Smith, would you like to try? Oh, I'd like to, if you think I could. I'm sure you can. And if you find that you need help, come back to us. I'd like to weave like that. I'd like to weave like that. May I sit beside you and watch? I'd like to weave like that. Will you show me how? May I try now? Is this the way? No, not like that. Like this. Oh, they're starting to sing. Let's sing with them for a while, Mr. Biederheim. I'd like to. Will you sing with me? Oh, I can't sing. So many years ago. And then I could only sing when I had my beer. Oh, I can't sing either. I just like to. We don't have to sing. We'll just listen together. Biederheim as a patient who had placed a loom between himself and the world around him. Week after week, for months, Mrs. Smith patiently proved her friendship for Mr. Biederheim. If we've come to feel that no one loves us, we can only respond with hate or retreat to safety within ourselves. But always somewhere deep inside, there's the need to love and be loved. If we can learn to trust just one person, then slowly we can find our way back to acceptance of the group. 
Only by working with other people can we truly grow and come to realize our inner strength. But in the process of growth, sometimes we're hurt. Our gestures of friendship are rejected. Consider the case of Betty, a therapy aide who is conducting a rhythm band. That was nice, ladies. Let's see. Would you like to play the new one that we just learned the other day? We have the music for that? She isn't playing. Well, she will when she gets ready. You may think you're the woman my father married, but you're not. like to go for a walk? I think Rosie would. Yes, we would. The therapist wasn't physically hurt, but her feelings were. And feelings are real. They must be dealt with. Perhaps our impulses would lead us to strike back. But Betty's learned that constructive action is a more satisfying solution. Here in this hospital, we're constantly trying to find ways of involving our patients in acting and doing and taking part. This is extremely difficult where the patient is withdrawn, where the symptoms of the illness itself are largely the refusal to act or do. But every effort is made to discourage them from just sitting around doing nothing. Okay, come on now, Eddie. Catch it. Here it comes. Catch it, Ed. Don't be afraid of it. Come on now. Catch it this time. Watch it. Here it comes. These troops will never learn anything. Oh, take it easy, Joe. Come on, John, now. Catch it. Here it comes. Come on. Oh, don't be afraid, John. Come on. Hold it. You throw it to me. Throw it hard now. Come on, John. Throw it. Come on. Good. Try again, John. Hold it now. Throw it further. Now, throw it real hard. Come on. That's it. Okay, Pete. Oh, Joe, fix Pete's straps, will you? He can't catch a ball that way. Well, what are we supposed to be, nursemaids? Just fix them. Go ahead. Okay, Bob. Ready? Here it comes now, Bob. Catch. That's it. Good. Now throw it back. Come on. Nice. Okay, Jack. Your turn. You ready, Jack? Here it comes now. Catch it. Come on, Jack. All set, Pete? Okay, now, Pete, catch it now. Watch it. Here it comes, Pete. Fine, now, isn't that this bandit? Al is new at this job of recreational therapy. And so it's hard for him to think of grown men as being helpless and childlike. His patience is tried by their lack of responsiveness. And he's tempted to demand skills that seem right for age and size. Al will learn that, like a child, a withdrawn patient must take his own time. He can't be hurried. And our goal for him must be limited by his own capacity for change. Come on, Eddie. Catch it now. Here it comes. Nice catch, Ed, now. Make a basket. Come on, Ed. Right in. You can do it. Try it, Ed. Come on. Make a basket, Ed. That's it now. Throw it. Come on. Nice try, Ed. Okay, John. You're next now. Catch it. Here it comes, John. Good catch now. Right in the basket, John. Oh, swell. Nice one. Gee, it's hard to believe we come this far, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, and you should see my fellows around. Let's look at this. Now, all the way back, Al. Boy, it looks like they're making a big league stuff there. And yeah, you're not so bad there yourself. Okay, Pete. Ready? Here comes Pete. 
catch. That's it now, right in the basket. Come on. Try and get it right in. Oh, good try. What do you say there, Pete? <coughs> I play ball. What'd he say? What'd you say, Pete? Say it again. I play ball. I'm oh, big darn. That's my boy. Patience is more than a virtue. It's a tool that we can use to chip away the layers of mistrust and apathy. It isn't easy to remember that a withdrawn patient wasn't always this way. And that with our help, he may again go out to play ball. In our community, the mental hospital community, there are many chores to be done. As in any other town, there are shoes to be repaired, meals to be cooked, dishes to be washed, lawns to be mowed, and laundry to be done. When he's ready, a patient may be assigned to any of these tasks. Years ago, some of our hospitals used the patient to get the work done. There's little thought as to whether or not the patient was being helped toward recovery. Today, however, we think of such work as our newest therapy. And the industrial therapist has become an important member of our hospital team. It's his job to make sure that the work is helping the patient and not simply the hospital employee who must get the chores done. With an understanding of the needs of both, he can make the relationship mutually beneficial. I just came over to see how you're working out on your job. What's happened? I won't, I won't. I won't do that any longer. I won't go back to that awful place. I'm so tired. What seems to be the trouble? You were doing such a nice job last week. Mrs. Kozak was so pleased. She's not pleased now. She keeps after me all the time. She says I keep getting slower and slower. I don't seem to be getting anywhere. What would you like to do, Louise? Oh, so there you are, Louise. I'm glad to see you talking with her, Mr. Maxwell. She isn't doing a bit well, and I think she's headed for trouble. We can talk about that later, Mrs. Kozak. Will you excuse us, please, Louise? Mrs. Kozak, Louise seemed so discouraged and tired from the way she spoke. Well, I don't know how she spoke to you, but the way she cried and threw herself around, I think maybe you ought to take away some of her privileges. Well, you sound as though you think she should be punished. I'm sure you don't mean that just because she isn't working out too well in this job. Well, no. She started out good, done more than the others at first. Well, maybe the folding job was just the right thing for her when she started. I think maybe she's ready for a change. Can you think of anything else in your department that she might do? How about the sorting room? She's had work and things similar to that. We do need a girl there, but what about the towels? Well, I'll get you somebody for the towels as soon as I can. Louise is obviously unhappy there anyway, and she knows you're not pleased with her work. That's right. You know, sometimes when a patient is unhappy with their assignment, this means that they're improving and they're capable of a better job. Mm. Why don't you talk with Louise about that sorting room job? Try and show her that you have confidence in her. You know, Louise wants to please you, Mrs. Kozak. We all like to please our boss. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Louise! Louise, Mr. Maxwell tells me that you know about things like the sorting room job. Would you like to try that? Yes. I guess I could. I'm sorry about the way I acted. Oh, sure, sure. Let's go take a look at the sorting room. One thing you'll like, you can handle all the different kinds of clothes. 
And Louise is doing an excellent job in the sorting room. She's ready for discharge. Mrs. Kozak is sorry to lose her. The interesting fact is that when Mrs. Kozak gets in a pinch, Louise, of her own accord, gives her a hand. Well, if I had to work on a Mrs. Kozak, I'd quit. Mrs. Kozak was hired as a laundress and not as a therapist. But our industrial workers can help the patient a great deal if they have sympathy for him and understand his needs. People are always asking me, why do patients have to work in the institutions? And I don't know quite how to answer that. Mr. Maxwell, perhaps you'd like to answer that. Well, industrial therapy is a final stage of treatment. It's the bridge between the hospital and the outside world. Most patients will have to support themselves when they get home. And the responsibilities they assume here will help them in facing the problems they'll have when they get back into society. When a patient first comes to the hospital, he's confused and fearful. He's with us because the pressures of his surroundings have become too great for him to handle. In the beginning, he needs only our reassurance and sympathy. He can be pushed too fast. But little by little, if he finds his trust in other people is not betrayed, if he can learn to take responsibility for himself, he'll learn to work and play with other people. And playing is just as much a part of healthy life as working. It's nice of you to help us set up for our party. We're always glad to help us for a party. Are we going to have something to eat? Yes, later. Marge, would you like to play a game of checkers with me? I'm waiting for Al. We always play checkers. Yes, I know, but I thought you might like to play a game with me until he gets here. All right. Waiting for your boyfriend, huh? She always calls me my boyfriend just because we play checkers. My goodness, can't we play games together without his being my boyfriend? I should think. Well, of course you can, Marge. I think I'm going home soon. Aw, oh, you always say that. My father put me here. He didn't have any right to put me here. I shouldn't be here, and I don't belong here. I don't belong here either. The FBI put me here. Oh, the FBI. That's right, they did. They're still looking for me. They don't know where I am. Go on and play. Oh, hello, Al. Hi, Mr. Ames. Hi, Marge. I see you already started the game. Oh, how nice you look. I always look nice when I go to a party. Say, Jack, you remember that dance that we were doing the other day? Yeah. Would you like to learn a little more of that now? Remember, it's one, two, one, two. Jack, you're doing all right. You really know how to jitterbug. Well, you don't do so bad yourself. Where'd you learn that hot step anyway? Oh, Arthur Murray taught me that himself. Yeah, I'll bet Arthur Murray did. Would you like to learn some more? Yeah, I'll try it. Let's all dance, shall we? Let's. Yeah. 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 Let's do it. Okay, here we go. In everything we've seen here, in every activity, in all the many faces of the work in our hospital, there is one underlying theme, sympathetic understanding of the needs of the patient. If a sick man or woman is ever to be restored to health, it must be through patience, 
respect and understanding. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.